the Rings of Power. They are the fulcrum of the Lord of the Rings, and yet they are some of the most secretly guarded artifacts in Middle-earth. So what are the Three, the Seven, and the Nine, and what exactly do they do? Ala Tulia Meldonia Ahara Mariese, my name's Rainbow Dave, and welcome to another episode of Tolkien Untangled. So, the Rings of Power. Let's start with how many are there? Well, in Fellowship of the Ring, we're told that way back in the day, and by that I mean relatively early Second Age, the Elven Smiths of Eregion forged many lesser rings as essays in their craft, and we're also told that Saruman actually forged some kind of magical ring as well, although his would have been made way later towards the end of the Third Age. But as interesting as these lesser rings may be, they are not rings of power. Not including the One Ring, which probably deserves a video all of its own, there are only 19 Rings of Power, and their stories begin with two incredibly powerful craftsmen. So first off we have Celebrimbor, the Lord of Eregion, and fun fact, the grandson of Feanor, the dude who forged the Silmarils way back in the Silmarillion. So crafting exquisite objects is very much in Celebrimbor's blood. But the other craftsman that I need to talk about is a guy called Anatar, the Lord of Gifts. And unlike Celebrimbor, Anatar is not actually an elf. And he's not a man or a dwarf either. Anatar is a Maya. He's of the same race as the Balrogs or Gandalf before he became a wizard. And it was Anatar who instructed Celebrimbor, along with his guild of elven jewelsmiths that are called the Gwaithi Myrdain, it was Anatar who taught them how to forge rings of power. And together, Anatar and Celebrimbor forged 16 rings in Eregion. However, once Celebrimbor had mastered this craft, he went off on his own and he forged three other rings completely independently of Anatar. He used Anatar's knowledge, but Celebrimbor forged these three rings alone. Anatar never had a hand in their devising. And the reason that that's so important is because, although I tried to be all like dramatic with this whole Anatar thing, I reckon most of you will already know Anatar is in fact just an alias for Sauron. It was Sauron who taught Celebrimbor the art of ring forging. So, as you guys definitely already know, after Celebrimbor forged his three secret rings, Sauron forged a secret ring of his own. The Master Ring, to bind all others. One ring to rule them all. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in the specifics. I've already made a video that goes into way more detail on this. I'll put a link to it below. But because all the rings of power are connected, in that they were all forged using Sauron's knowledge, as soon as Sauron puts the one ring onto his finger, Celebrimbor, who still has the three and the sixteen in his custody, he immediately feels Sauron's evil, and he realizes that he has been deceived. And so this kicks off the epic war of the elves and Sauron, which to very briefly summarize, ends abysmally for Celebrimbor. In the sack of Eregion, Celebrimbor dies an astoundingly awful death, and Sauron reclaims all 16 of the rings that he had a hand in forging. However, just before his brutal death, Celebrimbor splits up the three elven rings, and he sends them far, far away from Sauron. So that's the origins of the Rings of Power, and by 1697 of the Second Age, Sauron has the one and he has the sixteen in his possession. And this is where we first see the original sixteen Rings of Power split between the nine and the seven. So as you all know, the nine are gifted by Sauron to mortal men, and the seven are gifted to the race of dwarves. Now I won't go into too much detail about the Nine, partly because the very next video I'm going to upload will be all about the Nine Nazgul, and as we all know, the Nazgul are the result of those Nine Rings. But I will briefly mention the Seven Rings that are given to the Dwarves, 
And honestly, with the benefit of hindsight, these seven rings do seem like a bit of a waste, at least from Sauron's perspective. You see, when the dwarves were first created, they were specifically devised to be able to resist corruption and dominion. And so the rings of power really don't have the same effect on the dwarves as they do on men. You know, there are no mini dwarven Nazgul, the rings don't even make the dwarves invisible. Although, that is not to say that the Seven have no effect on their wearers. They were given to seven different dwarven kings, and we know that the rings amplified their owners' greed and gold lust. Over time, seven treasure hordes were stockpiled, and these, of course, attracted the dragons. So, the rings did end up benefiting Sauron in the long run, although not really in the way that he initially intended. And unlike the nine that he gave to men, Sauron never got all the dwarven rings back. Four of them were devoured by dragonfire and were thus lost forever, and although Sauron did eventually reclaim the other three, it took him a long old time to do it. So, actually two of the seven he seems to have found relatively easily, but the last one, the one that belonged to King Durin III, which according to legend was actually given by Celebrimbor instead of Sauron, although this is just a dwarven tradition and in my mind it seems pretty unlikely to be true. But anyway, the last dwarven ring was not reclaimed by Sauron until the year 2845 of the Third Age. That's 4,788 years after it was forged. And incidentally, this ring features in a subplot of the Hobbit movies. It's the one that Thorin's father had. But anyway, in my mind, the most interesting of the Rings of Power are those three elven ones, which Celebrimbor forged in secret and then sent far away beyond the reach of Sauron. So, although the three were forged independently of Sauron, because Celebrimbor used the lore and the knowledge that Sauron taught him, the three were still bound to the One. And so, as long as Sauron possessed his One Ring to rule them all, the Elves were unable to wear or to use theirs. But they did keep them safe, and they did keep them secret. So, the first Elven Ring that I'll talk about is Nenya, the Ring of Water, also known as the Ring of Adamant. And this ring was forged of Mithril and set with a diamond. And it was given by Celebrimbor to his father's cousin, Galadriel. Now, in the Unfinished Tales, there's actually a single reference to Celebrimbor being in love with Galadriel, but Christopher Tolkien himself points out that this is never mentioned again anywhere in the Legendarium, and so it probably shouldn't be taken as canon. And to be honest, I agree. Galadriel is very much in love with her husband, Celeborn, and Celebrimbor's romantic feelings never actually go anywhere, they never contribute anything to the story, and the fact is, in the published Silmarillion, Galadriel and Celebrimbor are cousins, or cousins once removed. And so I definitely do think that this romantic subplot was probably an earlier thought of J.R.R. Tolkien's that he discarded way before he got to the later Silmarillion. Anyway, regardless of that tidbit, Nenya, the ring, is a really cool piece of jewellery. But despite what you might expect, neither Nenya nor any of the elven rings bestow powers of like elemental magic, they don't cast fireballs or anything like that. The power of the Elven Rings is in preservation, protection, and concealment from evil. They are objects of secrecy and defence, they are not weapons. And, as I mentioned a moment ago, as long as Sauron possessed the One Ring, the Elven Rings could not be worn or even used. However, after the War of the Last Alliance, when Sauron was cast down and his ring was taken by Isildur, Galadriel was finally able to wield Nenya as it was originally intended. So, Galadriel uses her ring to strengthen and enhance the realm of Lothlorien. And it's here that we see Nenya's most fundamental purpose. It is an artifact that slows the effects of time. I suppose it is the nature of all things to eventually fade and pass on, even elves. But with Nenya, 
Galadriel was able to hold back time and preserve the immense beauty of her realm. However, there is a flip side to using Nenya, for it increased Galadriel's sea longing, her desire to travel to the ocean and to pass into the uttermost west from whence she'd come. And this brings us to one of the most bittersweet facets of Galadriel's character. Because, as we know from the Lord of the Rings, Galadriel is an essential part of aiding the Fellowship in their quest, and especially in aiding Frodo. You know, without the file of Galadriel, it's highly likely that the quest would have failed, as neither Frodo nor Sam would have made it into Mordor. And yet, the whole point of Frodo's quest is to destroy the very ring that gives Nenya its power. Galadriel's gift to Frodo is a huge sacrifice on her part. Because of it, Frodo's quest succeeds, but all the beauty and all the splendour that Galadriel spent thousands of years devising is undone by the destruction of the One. But there is a sweet side to this bittersweet moment, because although Galadriel's gift to Frodo helps him bring about the ruin of her beloved realm, as well as the diminishing of her ring, it is her gift to Sam that ensures Lothlorien's legacy will live on. Galadriel, of course, gives to Sam a silver nut, that after the quest is complete and the scoured shire is made right again, he plants in the very spot where Bilbo's party tree once stood. And that nut grows into the only Malorn tree between the mountains and the sea. It is a tree of Lothlorien, a tree originally of the Undying Lands, and one of the fairest trees anywhere in the world. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Anyway, I guess that tangent has more to do with Galadriel's gifts than her ring, so getting back on topic, there's one more thing to point out about Nenya before I move on, and that's its secrecy. Although we obviously know who the Elven Rings belong to, the people of Middle-earth do not. The locations and the keepers of the rings are kept entirely secret, so much so that Nenya is, for the most part, invisible to look upon. We are explicitly told that all Sam can see upon Galadriel's hand is what looks like a star between her fingers. The only person who can see Nenya for what it truly is, is Frodo, for he is the bearer of the one. Anyway, up until the final chapter of the final book of the Lord of the Rings, we never learn who the bearers of the other two elven rings truly are. Although, for the purposes of this video, am I going to spoil that? So we're told that the mightiest of all three elven rings is called Vilia, the Ring of Air, or the Ring of Sapphire. Now, Vilia's great power lies in healing, and it was given by Celebrimbor to another of his family members, the High King of the Noldor and the highest ranking elf of the entire Second Age, Gil-galad. So, for many years, Vilia was kept by the Noldor's High King, but unfortunately, in the War of the Elves and Sauron, which I mentioned a few minutes back, Gil-galad was the main commander of the Elven forces, and I feel like he probably knew that there was a very decent chance that he'd end up getting killed by Sauron. High Kings of the Noldor do tend to die in battles, historically speaking, so in order to prevent Sauron from ever getting his hands on Vilia, Gil-galad gave his ring to one of his chief lieutenants, his regent in the north, and his all-round great friend, Lord Elrond. And it's kinda lucky that he did, because at the end of the Second Age, Gil-galad does indeed die by Sauron's hand. And so throughout the entirety of the Third Age, Vilia belongs to Elrond. And with Sauron gone, Elrond is finally able to use it. And just as Nenya protects and preserves the hidden realm of Lothlorien, so too does Vilia strengthen and conceal the hidden valley 
of Rivendell. Now, Viliar doesn't make much of an appearance in the text of The Lord of the Rings, but we can certainly speculate that its power is perhaps a significant part of what allowed Elrond to heal Frodo's injury after he's stabbed by the Witch King's Morgul Blade. And we can also speculate that, perhaps, Viliar somehow augmented Elrond's power when he and Gandalf summoned the Great Flood to wash away the Nazgûl at the Fords of Bruinen. Which, I guess, finally brings us to the third elven ring, Narya, the Ring of Fire. Now, Narya's power is a little bit different to Nenya's and Vilya's, and that's because Narya is all about inspiring resistance against evil. In fact, we're told, rather poetically, that with the Ring of Fire you may rekindle hearts in a world that grows chill. But there is a little bit of a contradiction on who Narya's original bearer was. In some versions it was first given to Gil-galad, in others it was given to a lesser known elf called Círdan the Shipwright. However, whichever version you believe, it is Círdan who keeps Narya throughout most of the Second Age and the first millennium of the Third Age. Now, Círdan is a character that I'll talk a lot more about in future videos. He's one of my absolute favourites. But what I'll say for now is simply that Círdan is the Lord of the Grey Havens. And you may be recognising a little bit of a pattern here. Throughout the Third Age, there are really only three elven realms that are able to completely resist the spread of evil. They are Lothlorien, Rivendell, and the Grey Havens. Three places protected by elven rings. It's not a coincidence. However, Círdan does not hold on to Narya forever. About a thousand years into the Third Age, so that's about a thousand years after Sauron loses his ring, a Grey Pilgrim arrives at the Grey Havens and Círdan welcomes him, knowing whence he came. In fact, Círdan says, take this ring, for your labours will be heavy, but it will support you in the weariness. Now, for any who don't know, this Grey Pilgrim is in fact Mithrandir, aka Gandalf. And I find this really awesome because the whole point of the Elven Rings is that no one knows who bears them, and yet Gandalf wears Narya throughout all of his time with the Fellowship, as well as for like thousands of years before that, but no one seems to know. You know, all this time Gandalf is talking to Frodo about what it means to be a ring bearer, and Gandalf is bearing a ring of his own, but he never says so. Well, maybe he never says so. Remember that badass moment where Gandalf is facing down the Balrog on the bridge of Khazad Dûm? And he says to his enemy, I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. Well, although the secret fire is totally its own thing, pertaining to Eru Iluvatar, that's the creator of everything, the flame of Anor may actually be a subtle reference to Gandalf's ring. Tenaria, which he secretly bears as both the grey and the white, using its elven magic to kindle the fires of resistance within the hearts of men and dwarves and hobbits. And so, with that we come to the eventual fading of the elven rings, for although they were made independently of Sauron, all rings of power are bound to the one. And so, when the one ring is cast into the fires of Mount Doom, the might of the elven rings is ended. They become relics, no longer able to preserve or protect, and no longer lending power to their bearers. And I think the elven rings are an excellent metaphor for this sensual theme that the Lord of the Rings is really all about the eventual departure of magic. In the very last chapter of The Lord of the Rings, Bilbo, Frodo and Sam, along with Elrond, Galadriel and Gandalf, all journey to see Círdan the Shipwright at the Grey Havens. It is the last riding of the Ringbearers, and all but Sam and Círdan eventually leave Middle-earth at the end of that same chapter. 
With the rings of power gone from the world, the fourth age begins, but it's an age mostly absent of magic. By the end of Aragorn's life, none now walk in the gardens of Rivendell, and by the time that Arwen returns to Lothlorien just a few years later, Galadriel's once timeless realm is empty and ruined. Without the elven rings, the lore of the Elder Days is lost, and the dominion of men officially begins. I think the point of the elven rings in Tolkien's Legendarium is that although time may be slowed, it cannot be stopped. Things must be preserved and protected, but in the end, they must also pass on. Tolkien himself wrote that the tale is not really about power or dominion, it is about death and the desire for deathlessness. I guess on the one hand that may seem a bit depressing, but if Lothlorien didn't eventually fade, then what would be the point of Galadriel's gift to Sam? If Bilbo's party tree weren't ever cut down by ruffians, there'd be no place for the Malorn tree. Anyway, guys, thank you all very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and a comment, and be sure to hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any future videos. And as always, my dear friends, until next time, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.